and in terms of terms of global factors, we're seeing a disruption in global value chains, where China uh, in January and February had had a 17% decrease in exports. It's since rebounded to some extent, uh, or it's it, since since February, since from March to June, it's only down by about 1.5%. Uh, the other key area is, is South Africa. Their exports dropped uh, significantly in April. They're down by more than 60%. Uh, in May, they, they rebounded again to some extent, uh, and they're down by about 25%. This is leading to contributing to, as well, increased trade and logistics costs and delays, where in Malawi, we've seen imports down by about 26% in, in April and May. It's also contributed to decreased demand in export markets, where that'll impact on Malawi's exports a significant decrease in tourism, and also a decrease in remittances, where uh, they were down by more than 50% in April. Uh, they did rebound in May, but they were still down about 15% below last year. Beyond the global factors, we're also seeing a domestic demand and supply shock, um, which is increasing risk aversion and social distancing policies, which are leading to lower demand. Uh, which is largely impacting the services and industrial sectors. So here we're seeing uh, retail and the wholesale trade impacted, particularly this, the, the informal sector. Transportation and storage sector impacted, where there's a decrease in transportation and also international travels stopped. The accommodation and food services sector impacted by a drop in both international and, and domestic tourism. And the manufacturing and construction sectors impacted by uh, decreased availability of inputs. Um, yet on the positive side, this is where uh, Malawi's uh, seeing its second consecutive strong harvest. Um, and with agriculture being such a dominant part of the economy, that, that would help alleviate some of the overall negative impact on growth. So uh, maize production, it's up by about more than 11% um, over last year's already strong harvest. Um, despite this, there are some concerns about uh, how crisis could impact food security, uh, uh, which the government should, could, should consider as the crisis continues with the potential for um, market disruptions and supply to, to impact that. But so looking at growth projections, that's where we normally have uh, one specific projection for a year, and our baseline projection is about 2%. But we've widened the range of expected projections because it's very highly uncertain how the crisis will unfold. Even though we're a few months into it, the outlook, um, it, it's more uncertain than it has been in the past. So even in a worst case scenario, uh, we could potentially see uh, contraction and growth uh, contraction of the economy down to potentially uh, a decrease in 3.5%. So the key here is that it, it, it's highly uncertain how this will unfold looking forward as well. On the inflation side, that's where we've seen a positive picture. Um, with the onset of the maize harvest, uh, food prices have decreased quite a bit, um, and overall inflation has dropped from double digits in, in the end of 2019 down to about 8.5% in June. We've also seen that with these high food inflation uh, in, in Malawi, inflation is still somewhat higher than the rest of the region. But um, uh, in some other countries, such as Zambia, it's uh, increasing quite rapidly. Looking at the kwacha, that's where the kwacha has come under some pressure during the crisis. And um, looking at cash rates for the kwacha, we've seen those increase quite a bit so that the spread between those and uh, the telegraphic transfer rates has increased quite a bit. And at the same time, uh, with the fairly stable um, kwacha that's contributed to the real appreciation, which impacts not just competitiveness and the potential for exports, but then on the other side as well, it, it can uh, support an increase in, in imports. And that's where we've seen it appreciate by over 20% in, in, in the last two years and, and about 7% the last year. So the pandemic, we're expecting it to further increase fiscal pressures. The left, it, it shows the, uh, the fiscal deficit in quarter three was significantly higher, largely due to the substantial increase in expenditure. And then here on the right, we start to see the impact of the COVID-19 crisis on revenues, where um, 
the domestic revenues, they're down from about 1.3% of GDP before to 0.9% in April. On the custom side, it's down from about 0.4% to about 0.3%. And when you combine that with increasing expenditures, that's when looking to the end of, uh, of last fiscal year, uh, we're, we're, we're looking at a potential deficit uh, over 10% of GDP, which could be the highest uh, in, in recent years. These continued high deficits are uh, substantially contributing to an increase in domestic debt, where we, we've seen a shift from, um, from shorter-term treasury bills towards longer-term treasury notes, uh, which is having an impact on, on interest rates. And at the same time, we've seen a bit of a shift from uh, borrowing from the central bank has, has stayed level, which is actually a positive sign. Um, while lending uh, to commercial banks has increased quite a bit, as well as to foreign non-banks has picked up. And so here you're seeing uh, the increasing debt burden uh, expanding quite a bit. Looking at the external side, uh, we're expecting the current account deficit to widen to about 18.1% due to lower demand and trade disruptions. Where exports are being impacted by, by the lower demand and disruptions, we've seen tobacco sales are down, although actually uh, prices have, have remained positive. Imports are already declining, uh, as we mentioned, down in April and May, and they could face continued delays. Um, but this is where the drop in commodity prices with petrol and diesel imports being a substantial import, um, that will have a positive effect and offset this to some extent. When we look at the, the monetary side, so that's where uh, RBM, they've, decreased, they've increased liquidity by dropping the liquidity reserve ratio, as well as the, the Lombard rate, which is injecting uh, money into the financial system. Yet they've maintained the, the monetary policy rate to help offset potential inflation pressures. But then here on the right, that's where we see the impact of all this increased borrowing, where the, the dotted line shows interest rates across uh, across 90-day um, uh, T-bills all the way to 10-year uh, Treasury notes. And when you compare what they were in January to end of June, they've increased substantially, particularly uh, two-year, three- and five-year notes, where they've increased by, by upwards of 600 basis points. And that's a substantial increase in interest costs. And in the end, that's something that the government will have to pay for uh, with higher interest payments, which, will, which can crowd out room for uh, development spending. On the private sector side, that's where we've, we've seen solid growth in private sector credit growth. Uh, this is up through May, where it was still about 18.6% uh, year on year in May. Um, so it hasn't yet substantially hit uh, credit growth. And looking on the right side, we see the, the financial sector was in a fairly, uh, fairly good position. NPLs are historically quite low. They only increased a tiny bit from January to April, from about 6 to 7%. Uh, but overall, the, the financial sector was sound going into this crisis. But if we look at the impact of the crisis on households, that's where the difference across sectors starts to come out. Um, where here, if you look on the right, uh, in urban areas, about 75% of the, the labor force is working in the services sector, which is being heavily impacted. But then when you look at rural areas, uh, it, it switched where 87% are working in agriculture, which is, is being somewhat less impacted. And so that plays out in terms of our expectations on poverty. Where again, we're looking at a range of scenarios from a baseline scenario to a potential worst case scenario. But even in the baseline scenario, there's uh, an expectation of a strong impact on poverty, especially in urban areas where we'd expect that to increase by uh, potentially about 1.6%. In a worst case scenario, it could increase by around 5%, which would be a substantial burden on households. But so then looking at the policy options for the government as they work to uh, tackle the crisis and support medium-term recovery. The government's already done quite a lot. Uh, it's, it, 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 it announced various measures to support the health response and social distancing with uh, providing budget allocations, launching the COVID response plan, uh, recruiting health uh, personnel, 
um, and announcing various social distancing measures, which, uh, which are increasingly being enforced and followed in, in recent weeks. It's also announced various measures to support households and firms. Uh, it introduced a, a substantial urban cash transfer program, um, which uh, uh, is gradually being prepared. Um, and it introduced measures to facilitate e-payments and mobile banking, and also uh, measures to uh, help lessen the burden on, on the financial sector or on, on firms so that uh, they, could, they could delay payments on, on borrowing. But then looking to, to, to the new government, the, the government's inherited a very challenging situation. It not only has to tackle the crisis and prepare a medium-term growth agenda, but it has to do this in the face of very limited fiscal space and high overall risk of debt distress currently due to the large domestic borrowing burden. And so in doing so, that's where, uh, as a broader framework, um, the government can consider looking at, uh, first, protecting lives, second, seeing what it can do to protect livelihoods, and third, looking to protect the future. So in terms of protecting lives, this is where the primary concern uh, that the government should address is, is saving lives. To do so, it should enhance active case, case finding, uh, expand testing and contact tracing, seek how it can quarantine camp contacts and cases as part of a smart containment approach, and uh, strengthen case management capacity, all the while uh, trying to maintain essential health services outside apart from COVID. Looking at livelihoods, that's where uh, it, it can support families through uh, social cash transfers, especially in urban areas. But to do so, this, this calls for a process to actually um, collect the beneficiary data in these urban areas where uh, cash transfer, the cash transfer systems weren't set up in urban areas before. So that's, that's moving to a new area. There's also room to introduce digital payments here, and all the while, it, it, it still needs to ensure that there's strong accountability mechanisms. In addition, uh, the, the government should, should see how it can continue to ensure trade and markets continue to function as part of a smart containment approach. And so this is where, in, in markets and, and trading activities, uh, it, it should seek to strengthen health and hygiene standards so that uh, so that the informal sector especially can continue to trade and do so in a safe manner. It also needs to, to, to monitor the situation so that, um, so that when there are disruptions, um, it can seek to, to tackle and address those. It can also work to uh, simplify regulations and uh, potentially fast track some, some trade flows for essential items. Finally, it can see what it can do to support firms in the financial sector. So uh, back in April, there were various moratoria on loans that were announced. Um, and it, RBM can consider uh, discussing those further with, um, uh, with, with commercial banks because they, they've recently expired. And so it, it should, should see if it's possible to extend those or to extend renegotiation periods uh, so that um, firms that are borrowing can, uh, can, can stay afloat. Um, the government can also look at enhancing liquidity and lending support to MSMEs so that they can continue uh, through the crisis. On to protecting f the future. So this is where Malawi should seek to ad adopt measures so that it can boost um, recovery and resilience in the medium term. Malawi really needs to return towards a higher growth path so that it can increase incomes and create jobs. But to do so calls for two broader ranges of options. First, it should seek to, seek to have sustainable macroeconomic policies and the efficient use of public resources. Here, the most fundamental thing it can do is increase fiscal sustainability and build fiscal, fiscal buffers for the next shock. So that's where uh, the, the high domestic uh, debt burden is really coming to play. Um, and the government will have to make a lot of hard choices uh, to 
uh, when preparing its next budget. Um, it should start with credible revenue assumptions so that it, it, it's working within a realistic framework. And then it needs to select expenditure levels that are sustainable in the medium term to avoid, uh, to avoid a further increase in high cost domestic debt. And that'll, that will call for a lot of hard choices on, on both recurrent expenditure and development expenditure where it will need to prioritize uh, projects that, that have high returns. Beyond this, it should seek to implement transparent and credible financial management practices to ensure the use of public resources is, is sound and efficient. And it can also strengthen the oversight and management of SOEs, where it's already announced uh, a strong intent to do so, and that's that's a very welcome uh, that's a very welcome agenda uh, that can pay very high returns for, for the government. It can also seek to uh, increase exchange rate flexibility so that uh, it can uh, support competitiveness. Beyond this, as well. Malawi needs to see what it can do to diversify the economy and increase resilience. So here it should look at measures uh, about to increase diversification and, and commercialization in, in the agriculture sector, such as having uh, um, transparent trade policies, reducing market disruptions, and investing uh, in, in area, areas uh, in the National Investment Program for Agriculture, such as irrigation. Um, and then at the same time, it also needs to uh, promote a more diversified economy outside of agriculture. So that's where Malawi can increase its resilience by moving towards strengthening the rest of the private sector through working on energy and further reforms such as improving the business environment and simplifying business regulations and taxes so that they can support value addition. And finally, uh, it, it should see what it can do to create a sustainable national so safety net system. This is something that will be needed to support uh, the poor when the next shock hits, and so that uh, it can support resilience in the medium term. So with that, let me say thank you. The, uh, the document is online now at this link, and you should be able to download it. We have a lot more details in there, and uh, thank you for this and and we look forward to the discussion mm -hmm. well thank you so much uh, patrick uh, that was uh, patrick Hedinger, a senior economist at the world bank uh, uh, malawi country office a uh, quite detailed report uh, well articulated uh, quite interesting stuff we shall be uh, joined later on shortly uh, by uh, a panel of two more experts from the world bank to try and share with us what more uh, is it that's in this uh, report. But you mentioned quite interesting stuff there, which I shall be glad to uh, put back to you, but of particular interest just for now briefly, was the issue of uh, uh, formulating a budget that's realistic. Um, there's a new government now, a new government administration. Previously, the, the, the practice has been a new government will come in and wants to sweep everything away, bring in their new programs, that will require funding. Uh, how do you advise? How, how does the government go about that? There are programs that have been running mm -hmm. by the previous administration. Uh, they have new programs to try and factor into the budget. Mm -hmm. How do they balance this? Well, so the government it will need to start with, uh, okay, as we started to lay out, uh, I think, working on developing um, sustainable and realistic revenue projections so that it has an idea of how much it can work with. And then from there, uh, it, it, it should look at where it can uh, increase the efficiency of, of recurrent expenditure, where there's issues in terms of, uh, in recent years, there's been a big increase in uh, wages, and, uh, wages and pensions, uh, goods and services, uh, as well as subsidies and transfers. And we should see how it can contain the, the growth in those, because there, there, there's some room for cost savings in that. Mm. They're quite interesting stuff. Uh, we should have more on that. Uh, uh, j just, just hold it. If you're just joining us, this is Zodiac. We are bringing you the live launch of the 11th edition of the Malawi Economic Monitor. My name is Daniel Malawa. Please also note that uh, you can engage with us here in the studio. Uh, share your thoughts and questions. 
uh, on this uh, just recently launched Malawi Economic Monetary Report by the World Bank. Send your comments to uh, 54141, that's via an SMS, SMS to 54141, SMS with a keyword WB for World Bank. Alternatively, uh, rush onto our Facebook page, Zodiac Online, there is a topic of discussion there. A lot of people are already commenting, sharing thoughts. Please be as objective as you can confined to the uh, uh, subject here. Your comments and questions, I shall be able to read some of them later on uh, in this program. And as I indicated, our final segment of the launch of the MEM is a panel discussion. We'll take a short break and uh, when, I, well, I mean, when I'm back, I shall be joined by uh, uh, Patrick and two uh, other experts from uh, the World Bank to try and dissect into the report and what's in it for you, for the private sector, and for the economy in general. Do stay right there. We continue with uh, this live launch of the 11th edition of the Malawi Economic Monitor. And like I indicated, I'm now joined by uh, a panel of three experts from the World Bank. And just a reminder that you can join in this discussion that's live here on uh, Zodiac Television, uh, Zodiac Online, our uh, two online platforms, Facebook and also uh, YouTube. Uh, do send us your comments and questions if you can send us an SMS to 54141 but with a keyword WB I shall be able to read some of them alternatively go onto our Facebook page we have a topic of discussion there uh, people already expressing themselves on what is happening today at this momentous occasion of the launch of the Malawi Economic Monitor uh, quickly here is our panel this morning uh, we have like you saw earlier uh, Patrick Hettinger, he's a senior economist at the World Bank, but also lead author in this report. Once again, welcome, Patrick. Thank you. Uh, next to Patrick is Ephraim Chidima. He is uh, a senior private sector specialist at uh, the World Bank. Ephraim, thank you for joining us. Thank you. And uh, just close to me here is Chipo Msoya. Chipo is a social protection specialist at uh, the World Bank. Gentlemen, uh, thank you so much once again for making time to join our live discussion. Uh, let me start off with um, Ephraim. Uh, quite interesting stuff that's been happening. We, Malawi is in a crisis, the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, what are the main issues that we get from uh, the report that uh, the World Bank has just launched, particularly on how the private sector can be supported to remain business, 
but also in turn grow and support the economy. Thank you very much, Tanya. Um, that's a very good question, coming at a very crucial time when Malawi is going through this challenge. But let me just give a little context uh, of uh, what is happening. First of all, the challenges of the private sector have already been there. This has only been exacerbated by the uh, COVID. So let's start from the word of uh, job creation, which is at the pinnacle of the uh, government now, according to statements that have been made. Mm -hmm. If you look at what is supposed to create jobs in the country, it is private sector, mostly, mm -hmm. rather than uh, expecting that government is going to employ all the youth that are there available. So I think private sector issues are at the core. If we look at economic development, it will have to come from private sector, from the jobs that will be created. Mm -hmm. So the challenges that we have uh, is also looking at what has been happening even before the COVID, when the macroeconomic indicators have been pretty stable, mm -hmm. but then private sector has had challenges. So let's look at these challenges, and then we see what should government do to support, to support the private sector so that economic development can actually happen. Mm -hmm. I divide usually the challenges of the private sector into three pillars. The first is on the supply side, mm -hmm. and on the supply side, it's only limited amount, uh, number of SMEs that have access to credit. Mm -hmm. And since uh, most of the finances that are lines of credit that are offered by the banks are absorbed by the bank, by the, co the companies, large companies, and government. So that's one challenge. Of course, government has got a lot of areas mm -hmm. for the private sector. So that's another issue. And of course, accumulation of these areas uh, create limited space for private sector. Uh, to actually get resources. So that's, resources are not available. That's on the supply side. On the demand side, we have uh, actually large SMEs uh, that are not capable. If you look at private sector in Malawi, majority are small, medium, and, and, and so on. So those are not capable. So that's a challenge. And there's generally poor investment climate. These are issues of energy, I think this is of ESCOM, issues of uh, uh, trade facilitation, or even service provision by SOEs and other institutions. So these are three broad categories. I'll just mention very briefly what should be done in these areas. So before I go on to the COVID, because the COVID side is very small, so it will take just a, less than a minute. But basically, we need to have to extend um, resources to be available to small and medium enterprises, something that is not happening. That can be done by creating an, a wholesale uh, financing uh, that would be benchmarked and ring fenced to support banks. That is coming out very clear in the report that, that has been uh, 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 said here. And also <coughs> accelerated payment of government areas. Uh, that is very necessary, especially for small and medium enterprises that have good business. And those things, and those things must be in the budget. It must be in the budget, and it must. There are several ways in the budget, but also reallocation of resources okay. that can actually go into into that area. And looking at the COVID side, government already started putting up a moratorium on on interest and principal repayment by small and by. by private sector. Mm -hmm. But most of that went into the large scale. It did not go to the small and medium enterprise, which is the bulk of the private sector. But more so, this ended in June, and it's being looked at. This has to be looked at very quickly. And as one of the takeaways from the, uh, 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 the MEM, mm -hmm. I think it's very clear that we are actually saying, can you do something about it? Mm -hmm. First, look whether small enterprises are being done, mm -hmm. therefore restructure it if it is not doing that. Or, or and, at least extend it uh, beyond June because it's already expired. On the demand side, of course, it's uh, just strengthening the BDS and the business, business development services mm -hmm. in Malawi. For the poor environment, there's a whole lot of things, but when you ask private sector according to service, I think energy access to finance is a challenge. So on mm -hmm. the energy side, I think there's need to really improve service provision. Mm -hmm. And this means looking at the agencos and ESCOMs in terms of particularly governance issues. Mm -hmm. The selection of the board, which is, I think, eminent, which is eminent. almost mm -hmm. happening. Mm -hmm. I think there's need to do that, to be transparent. I mean, and also talking about... Um, uh, and just they're talking about ESCOM and, and the Jenko, we, we know we um, had a meeting earlier this week to discuss more about it. But you've mentioned so much about um, access to finance as, as being a challenge in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic. But one would ask, borrow for what? 
when businesses uh, are forced to close, both of, there is that there is that dilemma amongst the business community. Maybe is it time we, we were creative enough? Both of what, for example? I think uh, Patrick mentioned it that uh, it's not the right time to actually say close businesses. Okay. Businesses must continue. We just have to be careful how businesses are going to be conducted. For example, in the markets, uh, the best is to improve the hygiene. He mentioned it and it's very clear in the memo. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a way in which businesses can continue. Some businesses depended on imported raw materials. So that have been affected on things which you cannot control because it's much more difficult to get raw materials from abroad. But these businesses can have access, can access funds and start sourcing raw materials within the country. Mm -hmm. So that, those things should be uh, continuing. Business should not be allowed to stop. Uh -huh. Because what we need is to sustain the business that is there and even at this moment start, continue to help other businesses to start functioning. Oh. So on the SOEs, there's also management, uh, uh, recruitment of management should be transparent and should be professional. What has happened in the, in the country, if you look at most of the SOEs that are supposed to provide uh, services to, uh, I mean finances or services to the SMEs, the management issues, governance issues are there, and that has to be cleaned. Mm, quite interesting stuff there. Um, now, to Chipum Soya, uh, you are the social protection specialist at the World Bank, and we've seen recently government uh, introducing uh, some social cash transfer programs to the urban populations. But of particular interest is, based on your experience, uh, how well, could these uh, urban cash transfer programs be implemented in the work of the parliament? All right. Uh, first, to thank you, Daniel. I think that's uh, quite an interesting question. And I know that uh, Patrick uh, touched on some of the points, but I will try to simplify for our audience. I think um, first just to say that Malawi actually is a one of about 173 countries in the world mm -hmm. as of last week that had actually included some social protection intervention as part of the COVID response. Mm -hmm. So it just shows that actually Malawi is on the right track mm -hmm. in terms of crafting its uh, COVID response. Now, coming to your question of how well can the urban cash transfer be implemented, I'll highlight four points. First, is something that's already topical. Be transparent and objective. Mm -hmm. What do I mean? That's from the administrators. Point. Exactly. Administrators. When you're implementing, it should be easy for you and anybody, uh, anybody else out there to understand why is it somebody in intangible benefiting from an urban cash transfer and not somebody in area 47? Why somebody in Malabada and not somebody in India and the New Orleans? So that is part of uh, bringing out the transparency and objectivity. And then there's a point that I would want to address, which is something that uh, Patrick mentioned. And this is uh, the issue of, uh, technically we call it identifying triggers. Mm -hmm. Simply put, I think the government needs to use the evidence that's there. Patrick highlighted uh, quite an important point, which is part of the evidence the contraction in littering is affecting mm -hmm. informal workers. Okay. Simply put, we saw when the lockdown was announced, there were demonstrations. Mm -hmm. What were the people saying? We don't have safety nets. So, government needs to consolidate that evidence and identify when is the right time to implement it and uh, when is the right time to stop. And then the other thing that would be uh, considered... Just a quick one. Has yes. anything changed? Are we, as a country, ready for lockdown? Um, I think government is very clear that they will not implement the lockdown. Mm -hmm. But that does not mean that the livelihoods are not being affected. Right. The contraction in littering that Patrick highlighted is affecting informal workers. Simply put, people that depend more on a, a daily... Uh, income. So, as we're becoming more discovers, you and me, we are also saying we don't want the, carpet, the carpenters, the builders to come into our homes. We don't want to go to the market frequently. Implicitly, what are we doing? We are affecting the income of those 
that depend on uh, on daily wages. Um, I would I would add another thing which is uh, uh, quite important and provides quite a good linkage with the measures that the financial the financial sector has introduced. This is the best time to introduce digital payments. Simply put, instead of us going to deliver the cash transfers physically in adhering to social distancing uh, uh, precautions, this is the time to explore the mobile money platforms and other bank digital platforms so that that social distance is respected. And then I would conclude uh, by saying that I think one crucial element is actually accountability. And it was interesting to see in one of the dailies um, uh, this week highlighting how the Anti-Corruption Bureau is actually uh, monitoring the implementation of the cash transfers. It's crucial that implementation is accountable. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, quite interesting insights there from uh, uh, Chipo Msoya, who is a social protection specialist at the World Bank. And uh, back to Patrick, you, in your presentation, you were quite clear uh, how much authorities must support investment. But that is coming on the backdrop of uh, Malawi incurring so much uh, debt that's local and internationally. How should the government implement uh, uh, this recombination without pushing, of course, the, the debt to unsustainable levels? Sure, sure. I mean, this is a very critical question, and, and thanks for asking it. I mean, of course, first in the crisis, the first focus is really in the short term to save lives and investing in uh, case, uh, case monitoring, testing, contact tracing, and that's where there is some some donor support to see that. But then, in terms of uh, investment from the public sector side, that's where the government really needs to ensure that it has a sustainable fiscal policy. And so, with that, as you said, they're they're coming into a difficult situation where they have. Uh, high cost, high, high level of domestic debt, which is, is quite high cost to them. And uh, if you look at interest payments alone, they're, they're over 4% of GDP, which is one of the highest rates in the region. And this really crowds out the room for, for further investment. So this will call some, for some very hard choices about where to allocate funding on the government side. And so as we said, it needs to start with credible revenue projections so that it has an idea of how many resources it will actually have, how much, and then try to fit a sustainable level of expenditure within that envelope. And so from the side of recurrent expenditure, that's where the government can see where it can find some, some room for cost savings. Uh, there's been a big increase in, in wages and pensions expenditure over the last two, three years. Should see how it can contain that and, and create some efficiencies there. There's also been a big jump in goods and services expenditure in the last couple years. A lot of that's tied to elections and associated security spending, but there's a need to reduce this back to earlier levels. There's also some room for some efficiency gains in transfers and, and subsidies. But then on the development side, where there is a need for a high level of investment, that's where, first to start with, uh, it can prioritize concessional funding, which uh, is very low interest rates, below 1%. Um, and and, and that's, that's a win-win for the government. But then for the domestically funded side of development expenditure, that's something where, as we said, there, there are these very high interest costs, uh, where it will be paying from 10 to 22 percent for, for funding those. And so that's where it needs to carefully prioritize which projects uh, it, investment, uh, it invests in to see um, which ones are the highest returns. And only if the returns are higher than that funding cost of 10 to 22 percent should the government invest in those, because otherwise uh, the project won't pay off. And uh, if it's that case, then, then uh, the government and Malawi's people lose out on that project. Uh, so and, and, and clearly the reforms, public sector reforms, uh, must be key in, in all this, in all the management of the resources. 
yes, the management of the resources are critical. So that's where, uh, really, it's looking at both the recurrent side and the development side and seeing how they can be more efficiently implemented and uh, the allocation of funding, it can be selected better. But beyond the public sector side, uh, one critical aspect of this is it shouldn't just be the government that's funding investment. It needs to open up the private sector to investment. And of course, the government plays a key role here, as we mentioned, in terms of interest rates. If domestic borrowing is so high, interest rates will also be high, and that crowds out private sector investment. So that's, that's, the, that's why sustainable fiscal policy is where it is not running high deficits and, and borrowing so much from the domestic sector is important so that interest rates can come down. And then beyond that, uh, it can see what it can do to, uh, to support business environment uh, reforms, some as of which uh, Ephraim was, was discussing, uh, supporting the energy sector, but then also some lower cost reforms, um, assessing tax revenues and, and seeing how tax policies can be more conducive to supporting value addition and SMEs. Um, and, and, and some of those business environment reforms, they're not that expensive, but they can help unleash the private sector so that in the end, the private sector can drive investment and growth. Well, thank you so much, Patrick. That's a senior uh, economist at the World Bank. Um, like I indicated, you, you can join in the discussion, share with us your thoughts, uh, questions uh, to the panel of three experts here. A reminder, this is the launch of the 11th edition of the Malawi Economic Monitor by the World Bank. And uh, quickly, uh, checking through our Facebook page, but also like I indicated, you can share your thoughts and questions via our SMS platform. Uh, send your comments and questions via SMS to 54141 with a keyword at the beginning, uh, WB for World Bank. Uh, maybe a quick one for the panel that's coming from our Facebook page, Mike Lighton Luhanga. Uh, quite interesting. He says, nothing will happen in the next two years. No developments. Uh, what is your comment on this? Uh, he's, he's, he seems to be casting stone. Nothing will happen. I, I, I would like to believe this is in the view, in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic. He says, nothing will happen, no development. How do we go about this? Who, who would like to take this? Probably uh, Ephraim? Well, thank you very much. Um, that's a loaded question because development is quite, uh, mm -hmm. quite, quite wide in terms of definition. Uh, if, it, uh, if it means no development as in construction, uh, I, I think it, it will be there. Uh, you can see from the provisional budget, I think it looks like something will still happen. If it is development in terms of wealth creation, uh, I think there's a, there's a possibility, there's a probability that that can actually happen. But it depends on, on, on how serious uh, the uh, administration is going to, to look at, or rather uh, the managers of the economy. First is to ensure that, as I indicated, private sector does not die. So they need support now uh, to sustain themselves. So they, there's need to really put up some, if it is resources, or make it life, life, life easier. Then we'll see wealth creation still happening amidst the COVID uh, and several other COVID uh, activities that are already in place. They have to continue. Hopefully we should not lose, lose heart, but just encourage management to take it easy, to, to, to not take it easy or, or, or take life as, as usual. They need to really work on it. They need to really uh, put some work on there. Uh, more interesting comments coming through our platforms. Uh, Jacob Mazarari says, good report, thanks to the World Bank. I hope the main report unpacked on the safety nets being suggested. I can think of it in a different manner because different households or people will need different interventions. Can Patrick uh, explain more on this? Uh, Patrick, did you, did you get the question? Chipo, yeah, Chipo. Ah, Chipo, Chipo, yes. <laughs> yes, so uh, the question borders on different interventions mm -hmm. for um, uh, different households, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, I think uh, it's a question that makes uh, uh, quite sense, but then I would, um, I would uh, separate it into two. One, when you're in a crisis, right? The immediate need of the people is usually around uh, 
food and consumption. That's why now we, we are uh, actually encouraging government to provide these cash transfers. As livelihoods are being affected, most likely people's consumption of uh, goods and services also goes down. Mm -hmm. So you provide cash to allow them. In a normal setting, and maybe to, to borrow the word that it, the phrase that's flying around, when we are adjusting to the new normal, that's where now the issue of reaching out to households with different interventions becomes quite an important agenda. And that's where cash transfers would be complemented by livelihood interventions so that people are empowered. You have people that have labor, they need public works, for instance. There are certain people that need social insurance, pensions and all that. So yeah, that's a, a quite a valid question, but it's more valid for the new normal that's coming up and uh, that's what we have to adjust to. Mm. Thank you. And perhaps this one goes to you, Patrick. Uh, a particular James Fundo Tarari writes to us to say, good point that poverty is expected to increase in the urban areas by roughly 6% due to COVID-19. Can we introduce tax breaks or tax reductions for small businesses to help them build resilience against economic shocks? Yeah, that's a very good question. And uh, I mean, I think that's, that's something we've heard quite a lot. And I know the government's heard that quite a lot as well. And I, I think, again, that comes back to the bigger fiscal picture of uh, it, it, the government has very limited revenues and it needs to balance uh, how to support the private sector with maintaining fiscal sustainability. So it, it's actually a, a very difficult question. Um, but I think what it, what it can do is also kind of coming back to the first question about nothing will happen, is it can really see what it can do to support business environment reforms so that, so that uh, the private sector can innovate and it can, the, the cost of doing business can, do, can go down. And, uh, and it, it can allow, I mean, we've already seen a lot of innovation uh, in the private sector in the last few months. And uh, so that it can allow that to flourish more and increase the use of ICT. Mm, quite, yeah. uh, quite interesting stuff there. Uh, we should be moving towards winding up. Uh, our, our time is, 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 is not with us. Uh, but perhaps as a matter of, uh, uh, closing. Uh, I'll, I'm going to give each one of you one minute to to just try and wind up, beginning with uh, Chipo. Uh, thanks, Daniel. My, my, my takeaway message is quite simple. I think in a country where a fifth of the population is classified as extremely poor, where 61% is considered to be in precarious employment, mm -hmm. right? I think social protection or social safety needs becomes an indispensable part of the development agenda. Mm -hmm. We saw it with COVID, people demonstrating. Mm -hmm. Simply put, what are they telling us? They need us to start thinking of building in safety needs. Not just safety needs, but safety needs that can respond when there are crises. Mm -hmm. So that would be my message. Yeah. Well, that's uh I'm Sora, a, a social protection specialist from the World Bank, uh, giving us his uh, roundup remarks. And next to him is uh, Ephraim Chidima. Um, your, your final remarks. Final Thank thoughts. you. Thank you very much. Um, just like uh, my good friend Chipo here said, uh, but on the other side, I think we also need to put a lot of uh, effort on the private sector. As I indicated earlier on, when you talk jobs, you're talking private sector. When you talk development, you need, you're talking private sector. Now we can dissect a bit further what is private sector in Malawi. The majority are small. There's, uh, there's actually a very small number of large enterprises and a large number of small enterprises. So when we say in helping private sector, we're looking at even the large component, which is the small and medium enterprises. Uh, I think they've been left out. They need to really grow to create the middle, uh, the missing middle. Mm -hmm. That's when you see development coming. That's when you see jobs happening. So they need to have uh, deliberate policies to help the private sector. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So is 
uh, I mean, you couldn't stress it more on the need to help the private sector uh, develop or create the jobs that uh, the government has been uh, preaching during campaign and, and, and even before that. And finally, final thoughts from uh, uh, Patrick Hettinger as sure. we wound up. Thank you. Um, I mean, I, I think as we've said, um, the primary focus uh, should be seeing how, how uh, Malawi can, can save lives during the pandemic and, and bring down that curve and move forward on, on uh, wearing masks and, 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 and hygiene standards in markets. Um, then really, uh, I think it is supporting the private sector to see how uh, it, it can help the private sector flourish in, in, in the medium term and survive through, through the current crisis. And all of this uh, and, and the government's expenditure and investment uh, needs to be done within a, a, fisc a fiscally sustainable um, uh, budget and, and medium-term program. And so with that, uh, it, it can really help um, it, if it has a, a, a sustainable budget and sustainable uh, fiscal deficits, then it can really drive forward its agenda and it can prioritize within that agenda to help ach uh, achieve medium-term growth. Thank you so much. That was uh, uh, Patrick Hettinger, uh, Senior Country Economist at the World Bank, also bringing us to the end of this discussion and also this program of the launch of uh, the Malawi Economic Monitor, 11th edition. We earlier heard uh, the opening remarks from uh, our incoming World Bank Country Manager. Uh, uh, Patrick, it falls to you to give us a closing remark, uh, a closing statement for, for for the whole launch. Sure. Well, um, thank you very much for everyone for, for joining. Um, I think we've discussed a lot of important issues this morning uh, uh, of how the COVID-19 crisis is impacting the economy and households and, and the poor. And so I, I think we're, we've presented a lot of uh, recommendations and suggestions in the document for how the government can look to move beyond this crisis towards the medium term recovery. And uh, we'd like to thank everyone for participating and supporting the preparation of the report. And uh, the report is online and we'll, we have hard copies as well, which uh, we, we will share. Um, but thank you for everyone. Of course, you won't be encouraging people to flock to World Bank offices like, given, uh, given the pandemic. The, the office is currently <laughs> closed, um, but uh, we will be making uh -huh. select deliveries to Delivery. strategic locations. Quite interesting. That's it for policymakers, but also there's something in there for uh, all Malawians that are following, uh, but of particular interest are the policymakers, the ministries and, and everyone else. On that note, we wrap up uh, this special program. It was a live launch of the 11th edition of the Malawi Economic Monitor. Many thanks to the World Bank for bringing this live on uh, a couple of our channels. My name is Daniel Marawa, but also thanks to our panel, Patrick, Ephraim and uh, Chipo for making time to come and share insights into uh, the country's state of economic affairs. This is Daniel Marawa from the rest of the crew here at the Broadcasting House. It's bye-bye and thanks for joining us.